Okay, so our last ecology video here is going to focus on biodiversity within the ecosystem, as well as um, disruptions in the ecosystem that can have an impact on, um, on its stability as a whole. Okay, so hopefully we've kind of been catching on to this theme, right, that the more diverse things are, the more stable they are. Right? And that applies to ecosystems as well. So the more diversity within the ecosystem, the more stable it is. And we can increase this both by increasing the diversity within the species that are within the ecosystem, right? That allows those species to be able to respond to those environmental changes. Basically, remember that is going to allow for natural selection to occur. Right When the environment changes, if we have diversity within the species, we're going to have some organisms that are better suited to the environment than others. And so um, this will allow for that natural selection to occur. Um, also more species diversity, so a, a wider range of species um, within the ecosystem will help support that ecosystem also as a whole. And that goes back to, um, again, you can calculate that with that Simpson's diversity index. So in our image here, we can see that we um, ideally we would get a very diverse, a, a more diverse community would be these along the top here that contain multiple kinds of species. And then ideally within those species, there's genetic variation within them as well. So let's look at some things that can contribute to uh, really help kind of maintaining the diversity within the ecosystem and really kind of maintaining the ecosystem as a whole. Okay, so we're going to start first with what's called a keystone species. So a keystone species is usually um, not high in abundance, meaning there's not going to be very many of them in number. So they're usually going to be fewer in number, but they have a very strong influential role within the, e the ecosystem. Their niche is crucial. And so if this organism is removed, even though there's a small number of them, it can essentially, it can make the entire ecosystem collapse without this organism um, being present. We'll look at two examples real quick here with ele um, elephants and sea otters. So in this first picture here, you can see this elephant here knocking down the tree. And so elephants will, will do this. They will knock down small trees, which will basically open up the grasslands again. So they will um, create grasslands and um, basically allow for shrubs to remain. And their, um, their dung, basically their poop, provides nourishment for the plants. Okay, and it helps them spread the seeds in the plants. So these organisms, okay, um, even though they're few in number, they're helping basically maintain the land for other herbivores. Your sea otters keep urchins in control. They keep the population of urchins in control. Um, when sea otters are removed from the population, the urchin will grow like crazy. And basically what they'll do is they'll completely wipe clean. They'll wipe out the kelp population. You can see here it's all rock on the side on the left here. They will complete, the urchin will grow and grow and grow and grow until it wipes out the kelp population. And so by having the otters there, it keeps the urchin population in control. And that doesn't wipe out the entire kelp population for all the other organisms. Okay. In addition to um, these keystone species that can contribute to the diversity and the maintenance of the ecosystem, your abiotic and biotic factors can, right? So if we have major climate or temperature changes, drought, you know, maybe, maybe major water changes, habitat destruction, okay, these are things, so big climate changes, oops, um, big fluctuations in water avail av availability, um, habitat removal or destruction, those are things that obviously could make an ecosystem collapse. Okay? And do I have enough producers? Are there enough producers bringing enough energy into this ecosystem to support the trophic levels above it? 
Okay, so many organisms are going to have particular adaptations that um, make them, uh, you know, well suited to that particular environment that they're in, uh, that they're located in. So these adaptations, these are going to be genetic variations that have been favored by selection. Okay, and what they'll do is they'll manifest themselves as a trait that gives them a particular advantage. So if you look at this example over here with the cheetah, okay, um, so actually with the leopard, sorry. So with the leopard here, you can see the spots for camouflage, okay? Um, the way its eyes are made help it with night vision, the way its jaws help it to devour the flesh, okay, and so on. But these are all um, genetic traits that have been favored by selection to help this, um, this species, you know, be the best that it can be. And those genetic variations, remember, are usually a result of mutation. Remember that, that mutations are random and the organism can't say, oh man, it'd be way better if I hunted at night. I wish I could change my eyeballs so I could hunt at night, right? A leopard was born with eyes that made it better suited to hunt at night. It was able to get more food. It was able to live and pass that trait on, right? So keep remember that mutations are random and I cannot direct that based on the specific environment. Okay, so let's look at some things that can disrupt my ecosystem. Okay, the first one would be what we call an invasive species. So what's key about an invasive species is it is not native. And when it is not native, it usually has no predators. Okay, a lot of time there also is not very much competition. Okay, and so what this does is this organism comes in and this species a goes and claims a new niche in this new environment, but another organism probably already had that niche. And so now this non-native species that doesn't have any predators um, usually is able to outcompete the native organism for the resources. Again, usually because it doesn't have any predators. Um, some examples that we see here are um, zebra mussels. And you can see the zebra mussels here on the on that clam, as well as in this pipe, clogging up this pipe. Zebra mussels um, filter out algae that other organisms use for food, and so they at they attach and, and and onto the native mussels like this one, and so they make it they make it does it, that muscle is incapacitated; it can't open, it can't get any food. They clog up pipelines, they sink buoys. Um, they affect water clarity by filtering out all the algae, which is actually not ideal because then it makes water temperature rise. Um, so zebra mussels basically can wipe out um, populations within a water community. Kudzu is this vine that you see over here. Okay, this The kudzu vine is a, a climbing vine. It grows very, very quickly. It'll cover other trees, shrubs. It'll kill them due to the overshading. Um, you see this some in the south. Um, in the, like the true South, like Alabama, Mississippi, North Florida, Georgia, you'll see this kudzu and it will, it'll take over buildings. It'll take over anything. Um, Burmese pythons in the Everglades would be another example of this invasive species. Um, they've almost completely wiped out the Florida panther cougar population within the Everglades because they outcompete them. Some human impact things that can um, impact and disrupt the um, native species within the um, communities there would be um, diseases. As the humans bring in new diseases that could um, impact the organisms that are there. Smallpox for you know Native Americans and the Spanish conquistadors brought that in. Dutch elm disease, a, which was spread by beetles that you know again came over and um, it basically attacked the they attacked it's a they carry a fungus that attacked the elm trees that were here that we did that didn't have a resistance to it. Okay. Um, so humans can spread the diseases. They can change the habitats, right? Urbanization. So during with urbanization, I am having a lot of habitat destruction as I build and expand the buildings and the roads. Um, also, what's called monocropping. Mono is one. So with monocropping, I'm putting the same crop in the same field year after year after year. And so what happens here is that soil 
the each plant uses a slightly different ratio of nutrients. So if I keep putting the exact same plant in the exact same field, it'll completely deplete that soil from any resources, any nutrients. And so what that leads to is I have to use more fertilizers and more pesticides to try to keep that that soil nutrient rich. So it's actually better to rotate the crops as opposed to do a monocropping type of system. We can also have geological and meteorological events that obviously can affect habitat um, change and ecosystem distribution. Okay, our meteors, right, that meteor impact, the impact that would have had on the dinosaurs, right, you know, completely wiping them out by changing the atmosphere. Continental drift, right, that changing and shifting of the continents through geological time. We have um, support of that through some of our evidence of evolution. Okay, that biogeography showing these organisms um, that similar plants and animals found on different continents, but helping show that they at one time were joined. So obviously these large shifts um, would impact the local ecosystems and the local communities. Okay, and so this is our last ecology video. And so again, we'll be working with this material in class while we are continuing to prepare.